We welcome you here at the Technical Forum at the Group Exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells 2013. Please have a seat, have a free drink. We are really invited you to listen to the next presentation and ask the presenter at the end some questions. Come here and enjoy with us the next presentation dealing with the topic Long Life PEM Water Electrolysis Stack Experiences and Future Directions by Proton Mozart, his business development manager Steve Szymanski. Give him a big hand please. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm happy to uh, present this uh, on behalf of Proton. Uh, by way of a disclaimer, I first looked at this presentation two hours ago because my colleague was going to present it. So if it looks like I'm reading some of it for the first time, it's probably because I am. But uh, the good news is that uh, my colleague Everett will be here all week. So I would invite you, if I don't answer any questions to your satisfaction, to please stop by our booth uh, very close by. First, I wanted to just give a quick overview of our company because I don't presume everyone knows who we are. Uh, Proton is a, uh, a PEM electrolysis company based in the United States. Uh, we've been in business since uh, 1996. And we focus on a number of markets, and, and this just kind of gives you a, a very quick overview of the different markets we serve. And most of these markets are industrial markets for hydrogen that really don't have anything to do with energy per se, but we really think that the, the evolving markets are going to be in the area of energy storage, and that's why we're here, because this is really kind of a, a preeminent show for renewable energy and energy storage, uh, you know, particularly for hydrogen. So, you know, we've been developing products, uh, you know, since shortly after we were founded in the late 90s. We've had a steady history of product introduction in PEM electrolysis. That is our core technology, is PEM electrolyzers. And uh, to date, we have over 10 megawatts of PEM electrolysis systems shipped. And we really feel that the growth opportunity for our company, especially in the energy storage sector, is going to be based on a megawatt scale platform. And I'm going to be talking more about that in a little while. So, you know, the, the needs for energy storage, I think, are, are pretty well discussed. Uh, I've heard a lot of discussion over the last couple of days in terms of why we need energy storage to support the renewable energy deployment that's going on around the world, but especially here in Europe, where we think a lot of the early uh, adopter markets will be. And, you know, certainly the fact that, you know, the inherent intermittency and the utilization of renewable energy really depends heavily on the availability of large-scale energy storage. So there's a need for generation technologies for storing excess capacity. And we also think that energy storage can provide a link between utilities and transportation. Proton's been very active in developing hydrogen infrastructure uh, systems for, um, for, for uh, vehicle fueling. And so that's actually one of the things that we've been very active in in the last few years. You know, this, this map is something that I've, I've seen in various forms over the last few years, kind of describing where we think hydrogen energy storage plays in the continuum of options for energy storage. And really, we think it's, you know, at you know, the larger uh, scale in terms of megawatt hours of uh, requirement and also at the higher power levels. So you can see this uh, map from Siemens, you know, really kind of spells out where we think that segment lies in relation to, you know, compressed air energy storage, redox flow batteries, other battery chemistries, uh, as well as pumped hydro. Uh, in, in the United States, the uh, Department of Energy, Sandia National Laboratory has done an analysis of, you know, the cost of large-scale energy storage. And I know that's a, probably not easy to read, but really the thing that we're focused on is, is these curves down on the bottom where hydrogen fuel cells really, we think, can play well on a cost basis at longer hours of discharge whereas batteries tend to perform better at lower power, shorter discharge, uh, uh, discharge uh, rates. So the markets for a megawatt scale electrolyzer, we think, 
focus in several areas. Uh, transportation market, I touched on that already. I think the hydrogen infrastructure rollout plans here in Europe and Asia, and even in the United States to some extent, really uh, require a need for low-cost, large-scale uh, electrolysis. You know, certainly renewable energy storage, as, as we've discussed, you know, we need tens of gigawatts of wind and solar energy capability. Uh, in the biogas market, using hydrogen to improve the conversion efficiency in, in various uh, biological methanization processes is something we also think is, is uh, viable. And really, there's a multi-billion multi dollar opportunity in each of these areas. And so that's why we really feel that you know, a one to two megawatt product as our next platform is really going to be something that will help us to capture these markets. In terms, of a prod, in terms of a product attributes, you know, what do we think is important in an electrolyzer, a large-scale electrolyzer for these applications? Reliability is, is really critical. You know, I think you really can't afford to have downtime or high replacement costs. Uh, in terms of uh, price targets, you know, the, we think these are, are they're difficult, both in terms of capital cost and operating costs, but we think they're surmountable. Load following, we need the, have, to have an electrolyzer that has the ability to follow you know, a typical renewable energy load profile. Uh, the operating range, we want to have 100% turndown. We want to be able to respond with the electrolyzer from zero to 100% capacity in a relatively quick uh, uh, time frame. Efficiency, again, efficiency really drives the operating cost because right now, two-thirds of the cost of our electrolyzers, the operating cost, is the cost of the electricity. So everything we can do to improve the efficiency helps to reduce the, the, the power consumption uh, required. And scale, again, as I said, megawatt sca scale really is required for these applications. So today, uh, Proton has PEM-based hydrogen generators that are demonstrating excellent reliability in a variety of industrial applications. Uh, the cell stack technology is the most reliable component in the system. A lot of people ask us about how, you know, what the life is on a uh, PEM electrolyzer stack, and it's, it's actually very good. It's, uh, you know, we have stacks that have been running in excess of 60,000 hours, and so it's a very uh, robust uh, stack platform. Uh, new energy applications uh, do present capital as well as operating cost challenges, and we need to make technology advances to establish the durability and reliability that's required in this market. So over the last six years, you know, I, I wanted to just reinforce the idea that the stack uh, technology is very robust. And the top uh, pie chart shows that um, out of 292 million cell hours of operation on our stacks, a very small proportion have had to be replaced over the last six years, which is uh, very impressive. And out of that small sliver of that top pie, if we break down what are the defects that we've seen in those stacks that have had to be replaced, 90% of those are caused by customer contamination, okay? We know that if you put dirty water in the stack, you're gonna shorten the life of the stack. So really, um, when, when we look at the, the remaining issues, um, you know, some of which are some assembly issues, some of which are some material supplier issues, we have those kinds of corrective actions already in place to address those. And the customer contamination issue is something else that we can help with in terms of corrective action. In terms of durability, you know, one of the measures that we use to uh, try to describe the lifetime of the stack is the voltage decay rate that we see in our stacks. The top curve shows a design from about 10 years ago, uh, 2003, and we have a large field population of those stacks, and you can see a voltage decay rate of about four microvolts per cell. Now, in 2005, we implemented some design improvements, and since then, we, have, we don't even have a detectable voltage decay rate on, the, on this new design. So we feel very comfortable that you know, we can demonstrate in excess of 60,000 hours of life with no detectable voltage decay. Proton has a technology roadmap uh, that we have laid out to try to make sure that we can incorporate techno technological advancements that are going to help to meet some of these emerging markets. And so it's a clearly defined pathway of directed research. 
we have a balanced portfolio of near-term and long-term research and development, and we're leveraging third-party investment from a variety of sources to support this uh, research roadmap. And then what we do is, as we incorporate enhancements in our products, we then insert them into our commercial product lines as they become available and they become validated. And there's a list of uh, you know, US funding agencies that are supporting our uh, research and development, uh, including National Science Foundation, uh, ARPA-E, which is uh, a part of the Department of Energy, uh, Department of Energy, Environmental Energy and Renewable Energy uh, Group, Office of Naval Research and a couple of Army divisions as well. So we're getting a broad source of funding because these are the agencies that really value what we have to offer. In terms of cost and efficiency limitations, you know, one of the things that you know, we look at is what are the, the real uh, big hitters in terms of cost in our stack? And we want to focus on reducing the cost in those individual components. So on the bar chart, we're, we're showing you know, the different, a breakdown of the different components. And what's interesting is that the highest cost component in the cell stack is not the membrane electrode assembly. A lot of people think that the MEA is really where a lot of the cost resides because that's where those uh, you know, precious metal catalysts are, are applied. However, actually flow fields and separators are actually what we see in our designs are the highest cost item. MEA is second. Okay, it's a close second. And then labor. Labor cost is very high for putting these stacks together currently. So we, we want to focus on those three areas when we look at cost reduction opportunities, and that helps to drive the research projects that we, that we try to pursue. Okay, so we, in the uh, technology roadmap, again, we have projects broken down in terms of, you know, kind of near-term, mid-term, far-term, and we have funded projects uh, in every area of the roadmap, with the exception of uh, scale up in capacity and pressure, and Proton is making an internal investment in that area. We talk about the megawatt scale product. Proton is primarily making that investment internally to support the development of that uh, megawatt scale unit. But all the other projects, again, we have funded and in are in, our in process. In terms of cost reduction activities, um, you know, we, I mentioned, uh, you know, noble metal reduction is something that we, uh, that we know we need to do in order to reduce the cost of the MEA. And we are looking at a couple different approaches uh, to achieve that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. But you can see this is the kind of cost trajectory that we think we can see with some of these uh, ongoing projects that we have in terms of reducing noble metal content in our stacks. And really, the end goal is a greater than 90% reduction in the amount of noble metals that we have to apply to our MEAs. Okay? In terms of flow field cost, again, we have funded programs there, and we're looking at a, a, a very good cost trajectory there, where we're going to reduce about 60% of the cost in our flow field structures, which, as I said, that is the number one cost item in our cell stack. In terms of efficiency needs, um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is thinner membranes and being able to operate at higher temperature because we know that operating thinner membranes and higher temperature will help us to drive, drive up efficiency. The problem is that some of the legacy membranes we've been working with do not hold up well in a thinner configuration or at the kinds of temperatures that we want. So we're looking at some new uh, membranes with a higher glass transition temperature that are giving us much more stable performance at 80 degrees C uh, and uh, 200 PSI of operation. In terms of uh, cost on the catalyst side, uh, again, we're looking at different structures, different catalyst structures to uh, reduce the platinum group metal loadings that are in our uh, on our MEAs, and we're also looking at some different application uh, techniques instead of applying the catalyst to the membrane, which is a traditional approach for us, we're looking at applying them to the gas diffusion layers, uh, and we've had some very good results working on that with Brookhaven National Laboratory. On the flow fields, uh, we're looking at a new bipolar plate cell assembly design that offers us a 50% reduction in, uh, in, in metal uh, uh, content. And also on the coating side, we're looking at alternative coatings that help to mitigate hydrogen embrittlement. And I have a slide here next that shows how 
what we're seeing now with some of these nitride coatings that are being applied uh, through a process developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we are seeing almost no hydrogen uptake um, in, 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 these, uh, in these bipolar plate materials. So this is a huge improvement in terms of the hydrogen uptake and the resulting hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, the other thing that D has been done at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory is they have been studying the ability of a PEM electrolyzer to follow uh, the, a current command uh, and see what kind, how quickly can we respond to the current command and what is the impact of stack life on a variable kind of input. So what they did is they have a system at, at NREL that has three stacks in it. And this is a common configuration for us where we will put multiple stacks into a platform and they've been operating one stack on a steady uh, current and then they've been varying the current in kind of a wind profile uh, to see what kind of uh, life degradation there is in operating the stack in that manner versus a steady state kind of operation. And what they've seen is that there's very little uh, to almost no detectable reduction in life from operating in this kind of profile as opposed to operating at steady state. And that's very important for the kind of renewable energy systems we're talking about. In terms of stack and system development, one of the other major areas of focus for us has been higher output getting larger systems uh, in development. And so, you know, we started out with very small systems and we've grown our capacity in terms of hydrogen output steadily over the last 15 years. And that includes our stack platforms. We've looked at, we start out with a very small 28 square centimeter active area stack that we used in our laboratory lines. We've grown that to a uh, production stack that's at 210 square centimeters. And we have a, a new stack platform in development uh, at 650 square centimeters that will be the basis for our larger megawatt scale system. So we have a, a long and successful history in being able to scale up. So on the 600 square centimeter stack development, um, you know, we've got an improved bipolar plate design. Um, we have done CFD modeling to show the flow profile and we feel very confident we're going to have good uh, even uh, flow distribution throughout the cell. And we demonstrated at 30 bar over 20,000 hours now on this stack design in a three cell configuration and over 1,500 hours in a 10 cell configuration. So uh, today we are in the process of scaling the stack up to about 30 normal meters cubed. So that will have a single stack platform that can do 30 normal meters cubed. And then that will be put into the, the larger uh, system. And we're targeting you know, a 200 to 400 uh, normal meter system as that. Uh, megawatt platform. In terms of the stack performance progression, I think um, you know folks who look at electrolyzers, um, you know, understand a polarization curve looks a little different on a electrolyzer stack. And uh, you know, in 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 electrolysis, the uh, you know the curve goes up this way with current density, and you can see our current stack is at about a 70% efficiency, uh, higher heating value of hydrogen. And with some of the advancements that we've been incorporating through our R&D roadmap, we are seeing an increase to a greater than 86% efficiency uh, HHV. And that's a very significant improvement in efficiency. Uh, in terms of you know, trade-offs, uh, in terms of hydrogen generation, you know, one of the things that, that we have to think about is the, um, is the cost of you know, designing a system that we, we drive at, at higher current density versus lower current density. And I think one of the things that we need to do in evaluating this megawatt scale system is really what is kind of the optimal operation point so that we, we really kind of uh, capitalize on the uh, real uh, savings benefits of the large scale system. So, you know, when you look at the cost of the system, um, you know, you can see that 53% of the cost of the system at you know the the larger scale you know is the stack and uh, you know 32 percent is is the balance of plant 15 percent is power supplies and you can see of the stack breakdown as I said flow fields are about 48 uh, percent 24 percent being the MEA and 23 percent being the balance of stack 
So um, you know, we definitely have a lot of work there in terms of optimizing the, the stack configuration to get the cost down on the overall system. So right now, the megawatt scale product development pathway, we're looking at a multi-stack architecture. And that's uh, what we have been doing on our systems for a while now. We understand how to do it. We know how to control multiple stacks. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the, the stack platform I introduced before, the 650 square centimeter stack. Uh, again, the active area, we're increasing by three times over our current uh, 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 stack platform. And we've got the prototype uh, has already been tested. Uh, an advanced design, we think some of the cost reduction opportunities will able to deliver a 40% cost reduction in the design of that stack. And it's going to be an open frame kind of modular configuration. Uh, you know, we envision packaging it in a, uh, a container, ISO container. And as I mentioned, we're going to trade off kind of that capital cost versus efficiency for specific market applications. In terms of the cost reduction trajectory, we think we can see with the, um, with the scale up to the megawatt scale system, you know, right now, here's kind of a normalized uh, uh, chart for our current C30 electrolyzer, which is the largest uh, current electrolyzer we produce. And you can see as we go up in scale from half a megawatt to one to two, um, you know, there's a pretty good uh, reduction of almost 70% in going up to that two megawatt scale. And then there's some advances we can get used to capture a little bit more cost savings. But this is basically, to us, a straightforward kind of engineering scale up activity. The critical technology elements have already been developed and validated. So there's no real significant advancements that need to happen in terms of being able to do this. This really is just a scale up operation for us. So in summary, um, you know, industrial PEM electrolysis, we've got an excellent reliability track record. Uh, the new energy applications that we've been talking about will challenge that reliability. Uh, but uh, we have a technology roadmap that is uh, funded from different sources as well as internally that's helping to guide the process and helping us to insert different technology elements and different uh, performance enhancements as we execute those programs. Really, we think the market needs for hydrogen energy storage are emerging rapidly, and you know, we really feel that we are a technology leader in, in PEM electrolysis. And so we think we're well positioned to uh, capture this market. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomansky. Are you sure you see this slides for the first time in your life? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Very, very good. So, now it's your turn, it's your time for yeah, for asking or make some remarks. Hi, I'm Rudolf Kurzer from Daimler um, in fuel cell stack development, not electrolyzers. But uh, we are facing similar um, challenges, I think. Um, the question on your uh, cost reductions and your cost challenges, uh, you, you mentioned that the separators and flow fields is probably the highest challenge right now. Can you maybe elaborate which, maybe one step down into that um, detail, uh, is it material cost or is it the cost of coatings or which, which is the most important part of that? Um, I would say that it's, it's, it, you know, it's the highest uh, opportunity there is, is in materials because I think that when you look at what has traditionally been used for those, um, you know, for those flow field materials, um, they've, been, they've been very expensive. And so we're looking at lower cost substrates with uh, coatings applied to them to really help to uh, reduce that cost. So, somebody else? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Hello, my name is Artur Fakami from Ceramid. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of membrane do you use today? Uh, is, it, is it not confidential, for sure? No, I, I, our, our current membrane is, is Nafion uh, from DuPont. So, but we are evaluating other materials as part of our research programs. Okay. Somebody else now here? So, you invited all the guests here at the audience to your booth. Can you tell again where are you here on the group exhibit hydrogen and fuel cells? Uh, you, you can see the proton sign sticking up right, uh, right there. We're right there. Okay. All so, right. if you have any questions or you want to discuss anything with Mr. Szymanski, yes. you're really invited to come here. And 
So after a short, so give him another big hand, please. Thank you very much. After a short break, we will continue our program here with the last presentation for today with an overview of the U.S. Department of Energy, Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies program. Thank you very much.